is there any interesting number that can't be computed? The fact that our machines can't compute every number shouldn't bother us because most numbers aren't uninteresting. Right? We should only be sad if there are things that we care about that they, we can't compute. And the numbers probably, at least it's un unclear if that's the case. But functions, well, we know what interesting functions are. Maybe we can think of some function or describe some function that can't be computed. Right? So that's the question that we want to focus on. We know that there are some that can't be computed. Just by the simple cardinality argument, the number of Turing machines isn't enough to compute all the functions. So we're going to start looking for a specific function that can't be computed. What we're going to do first, we're going to define a function that maps a description of a Turing machine. It's going to take a string. So w is any finite binary string. And either that's a valid description of a Turing machine. We'd have to specify carefully how we write down our Turing machines. But based on however we specify that, some machines are going to be valid, some machines are not. And what we're going to produce, if it's a valid description, we're going to produce the machine that that represents. If it's invalid, well, then we're going to produce this special machine, which is this. This machine is just one state, no transitions, empty transition function. So what does this machine do? Our rules of how to execute a Turing machine say, so we start in state 0, tape index 0, and we look up our transition function for what to do next. What's going to happen with this machine when we look up our transition function for what to do next? Yeah, it's undefined. The transition function is a partial function. We haven't defined a total function. So we need to reconsider a little bit and at least be more careful. Our step here assumed that we always get an output from our transition function. It assumed that it's a total function, or at least it's defined on all the things that we evaluated on. But in this case, it's not. The normal way that is dealt with is to say, well, if you get in some state and your transition function is not defined, then you're stuck. The machine doesn't produce a value. It's like if you ran forever. So we need to be a little more careful how we define our machines. So what we're going to say is, if our transition function is not defined, if we ever encounter an input where it's undefined, then we're going to stop execution, and our output is this bottom symbol, which means there's no output. OK, so now we know what this machine does is it rejects everything. It's going to get stuck. It never produces an output. It's a very rejecting machine. The other thing that is going to help us to think about these things is to get comfortable switching around between functions and languages. The two can be viewed as essentially equivalent. So we're going to define a language of a machine as the set of strings where the output of that machine on that string is 1. We've got the set of all binary strings. We're going to define the language as a subset of those strings where the output of the machine is 1. And that's the language of that machine. Can we go from a function to a language? We just need to evaluate the function on all of the inputs that it could be evaluated on. And that defines the language. Of course, we don't actually have to evaluate it. That's how we're defining it. So now we can define a language that is the language of strings that the machine that we've defined here outputs one. So we've got a machine described by some input string. And now we're going to define the language the way we did. So that's the set of all strings where evaluating that machine results in one as the output. And now we're going to define a new language, which is all the strings where the machine that that string defines, the language of that machine does not include itself. That means that if we ran that machine on the string that described that machine, it would not output one. Right? It might output something else. It might run forever. It might get stuck. It doesn't output one. This should start to seem pretty strange, what we're defining. We will get to see why this is interesting and why it helps us see lots of other functions that we can't compute. We are defining a function that takes in a string. So any finite string of zeros and ones, that's our sigma here. We're going to produce the Turing machine, right? The output of the fancy M function is a Turing machine. And it's either the Turing machine that that string represents, 
if that string represents a valid Turing machine, the result of the fancy M operating on that string, right, this is a function that takes a string as input, is a Turing machine. That is the one that W describes. So for us to actually define what fancy M does, we'd have to find some specific way to write down a Turing machine. So each of our transition rules is from a state and an input to some other state, could be to the same state, to what we write on the tape in a direction. And when we write them or we draw machines, we use all sorts of symbols and funny notation. So if we're going to describe a Turing machine with a string of just zeros and ones, we'd have to have some way to convert that into just a string of zeros and ones. Maybe that's what it converts to, that rule. I don't know what it should convert to, but you can come up with some way of mapping the rules to strings of zeros and ones. And some of them are going to represent valid Turing machines, some of them are not. If we tried to come up with a mapping that could only represent valid Turing machines with every string, that would be really a pain. Maybe not even possible to do. But it's easy to just say, well, if it is a valid Turing machine, this fancy M function produces the machine it represents. If not, we still need to output a Turing machine because we want the M function to be defined on all strings, so it's a total function. We're going to just output a machine that rejects everything. Whatever input it runs on is always going to reject. If we want to describe machines, so now we've got a machine represented by this string w. Here's our string w. That machine defines a function, and we can write that function down. Well, that's just a lookup table. So on every input string, we can order the input strings. We have some way of ordering the strings. How can we represent the function? We can just look at its output on every one of those strings. So if the machine represented by 0, 1, 0, on input empty string outputs a 1, we could put a 1 here. If it does something else, we could put a dash there, or we could put checks in the ones where it outputs a 1. Either it accepts the input or it doesn't, there's two possible outcomes. Either it accepts it or not, and we'll put a check in the spaces where it accepts. So we can do that. We can imagine we've got some table like this. It's an infinite table. There's unbounded length of the binary strings, but each one of these we can write down in this table. It's defined on infinitely many inputs, so it's not a finite function. For any likely encoding, all of these small strings, what are they actually likely to encode? Yeah, they're probably all reject machines. At a minimum, to represent a Turing machine, we need to list the alphabet, we need to say the number of states, and we need the transition function. So probably, if our W string is three symbols long, we don't have space to do that. We'd have to have a really strange encoding. But I don't have room to show a table with hundreds of entries. So let's assume that these are valid Turing machines, and some of them, like these are rejecting. These might be the reject machines, at least what we see, assuming there's no checks anywhere else. And some of the other ones are accepting some strings. So that's our table of machines. We can think of all the Turing machines there are represented by some string, and we can look at that machine as a function on inputs. Each input is a finite binary string. OK, so now let's define the self-rejecting language. What the self-rejecting language is, is the set of strings where the language that the Turing machine described by that string does not include itself. So that's why it's called self-rejecting. W is here, we're looking at that input as a way to encode a machine. That machine has a language. And to be within the self-rejecting language, that string should not be in the language that its own machine describes. Does it seem useful? Probably not for anything other than proving something, getting some kind of contradiction. Well, unless you're really into rejection. But it's a perfectly valid language, and we can define it. We can also define a function. We said what a language is, the set of strings where the function outputs one. So what would the self-rejecting function look like? If we wanted to think of this as a function, how would we do that? So what are its inputs? Languages are sets. Functions have inputs and outputs. What are the inputs to the self-rejecting function? Yeah, it's just a string. It has one input, that's a string, like we use w to represent it here. It's finite binary string. And what its output should be is, well, we're going to run that machine, the machine that that string represents. This is a Turing machine. What are we going to do with this Turing machine? So we want to run that Turing machine on some input. The input we're going to run it on is the input w. The way we wrote that was 
kind of like this, right? We're running this Turing machine on this input. If it produces a one, what should we do? What should the output of self-reject be? If running the Turing machine described by W on W produces a one. Yeah, we should negate it. We should flip the result. So it's going to be something like this. If we assume not, it flips everything else in the right way. Got to be defined on more than just Booleans because the output of this is some string. But that's basically what it does. We're defining our self-rejecting function as it takes a string as input and it outputs one if the Turing machine defined by that string running on that input does not accept, does not output one. This M is this function. It means make a Turing machine described by that string. The other M is the one that we defined last class. This is the evaluation. M of X is the result of evaluating a Turing machine on input X. That's what we defined in our execution model. What we're defining is the function M of X, the machine running on that input, is the output of that machine as defined by this process. This is actually the wrong one because this is the no input machine, but we also define the one where it's running on, on X. That means what's here is we're running the Turing machine that the fancy M produces, which is basically the Turing machine that that W string represents. Now we're running that machine on input X, which in this case is W. Yeah, it's a little bit of a confusing notation with the two M's. So we've defined self-rejecting language. How do we identify the strings that are in the self-rejecting language by looking at the table? Is there an easy way to do it? Yeah, it's going to be on the diagonal. If the diagonal is empty, we are in self-rejecting. If the diagonal has a check, we accept it ourselves. We are not in self-rejecting. Anyone bothered by this yet? Going down diagonals, if you remember some of our accountability proofs, might start to worry you a little bit. But so far, it looks, looks pretty good. If we can compute self-rejecting, that means there's some machine that represents the Turing machine that does self-rejecting. Right? There's some Turing machine that can decide this language. And that means that the machine corresponding to that string, so there's some string, which must be somewhere in this table, that computes the self-rejecting language. And it must be somewhere in that table. So what should the value on its diagonal be? We're going to have some string. So we'll call MSR is the machine that computes self-rejecting. And that means there's some way to represent that machine. We'll call that WSR. That's some string of zeros and ones. So is it in self-rejecting? So we have two options. This is a binary question. Either it's in the set or it's not. So which one do we think it is? So could this be true? Could it be in the language defined as self-rejecting for its own machine? What it means to be in that language is that, right, this is coming straight from here. It means that it's not in the language of the fancy M of WSR. What is fancy M of WSR? Well, we picked WSR as the input that represents the machine that would compute this language. I'm being a little cavalier with my terms about compute and recognize and decide. We haven't defined those quite formally, and we've mostly been talking about functions, so I'm going to try to use compute. The equivalent of compute is to decide a language. That basically means we can say for every string, yes or no, is it in the language. But that's what we defined. This is the machine MSR. So is this OK? This is WSR. Well, that's not OK. We started option one by saying it is in the language of MSR. So it better be option two. We've excluded option one. So option two, well, we tried being in it. The only other option is to not be in it. So if it's not in it, that means it's not in self-rejecting. So it is negating this in this language. These are the opposite of each other. We have a contradiction. Neither option makes sense. Both lead to 
saying that something's both in and out of the same set. What do we do? Something must be wrong. Well, what's wrong, we assume something that's not true. We assume that the machine that computes the self-rejecting language, we assume that that exists. We've got a contradiction. It cannot exist. There's no machine. We didn't put any other constraints on the machine. We just said there's some Turing machine that can decide this language or can compute that function. And that leads to this really clear contradiction. So that assumption must be wrong. And that means this must not exist. So we have a function that cannot be computed by any Turing machine. It's a pretty big result. We said we were going to get to an interesting uncomputable function. Are we satisfied? Have we got to something that we think is interesting or is self-rejecting kind of a nice way to see something that's uncomputable? It is a specific one. It's not just saying the cardinalities are bigger, so there must be one. It is a specific one. But maybe it's not an interesting one. But we have proved there's an uncomputable function. But we want to get to something that seems more interesting than self-rejecting as our uncomputable function. Before getting to that, we're going to get to universal machines.